So yes, my name is Ashley. I'm the Hebrides Wildlife Officer for Orca. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about whale, dolphin uh, and porpoise conversation, uh, conservation across the UK. So I just wanted to ask firstly, have you seen a whale, dolphin or porpoise in the wild before? I wanted to see sort of what who has before, who hasn't, what are the percentages that we're looking at here? Whoa, <laughs> sounds like a lot of people will know what I'm talking about then. Just a few more votes to go. Three more votes. Perfect. So I will share that with you. So 88% of you have seen these animals in the wild. So that is fantastic news. Um, obviously, we do get a lot of these species in UK waters. Um, you may have seen them further afield, um, but fantastic that so many of you have been able to see these enigmatic creatures. So that's just a little bit of fun. So I'm going to talk a little bit about me as well and sort of my journey with Orca um, and what the Hebrides Wildlife Officer is and the different roles that I've done with them. Um, and Orca as a charity themselves, the science and policy that they um, are involved with, and then the fun bit, the cetaceans, uh, which most of you have seen, thankfully. Um, so here, this is just sort of my journey with Orca as it were. So I started with them in the wildlife officer placement. So this is a internship. So I was on board um, a Brittany Ferries vessel, the Cap Finisterre, for about a month, um, back and forth, back and forth across the Bay of Biscay. So from Portsmouth to Santander and Bilbao, um, which is a great catchment area for cetaceans. You, so there was a few days where you see 100 fin whales in one go, especially in summer when they're feeding. Um, you get a great array of, array of wildlife. You get loads of beaked whales, um, which are such mysterious, elusive creatures. They're deep divers, so you don't get to see many of them. Um, and this was such an immersive experience for me. I've ne I'd never seen a whale or dolphin or porpoise in the wild before at all. So it was just completely out of the ordinary for me. Um, and basically just on that first wild dolphin i was hooked That's, this is my calling this is what i'm going to do now um and i just found it really really great the people that was i was placed with so the wildlife officers on board were so knowledgeable and they really really helped me uh trains me up and it, within that month i learned so much more than I mean, I don't want to say university education is definitely worth it, um, but I definitely learned a lot of different skills that I didn't learn in university. And then part of that placement, you do get a place on the Marine Mammal Surveyor course. Um, so this is where you get to be involved with the Marine Mammal Surveyor programme. So this is surveying on ferries and cruise ships across UK and Europe um, and a bit further afield now, actually. Um, and this is where you use utilize distant sampling methods and distant sampling protocols um, to capture really, really good, really robust data. So then they can use it to analyze hot, hot spots. Um, and this is what's used in conservation. And then I did the cruise conservationist course. So again, this is quite an immersive course that they now do. So you're on board, it was the uh, Fred Olsen flagship. We were on board for about a week and a half. Um, and that was learning a little bit more than sort of your, your idea and, and your science and policy. That was learning about all the threats um, and also the different types of people that you're most likely to come on in touch with on a, on a cruise ship and um, how, to com how to convey this message as clearly as possible and how to inspire as many people as you can because it's such a domino effect. You know, on P&O cruises, you can come across 2,000 people or you can speak, you know, you don't speak to 2,000 people, but it's a lot of, I've delivered lectures to about 700 people. And um, so you're speaking to that big group of people, they then go home and say, this wildlife guide was on board, she taught us all about this, this, and then, it, you know, it just dominoes like that. So that's a great programme to be part of as well. And it's, uh, you, you certainly make friends in that programme. So you're with a little group and then they buddy you up and, you know, I still stay in touch with a lot of people from that course, which was great. 
And from that course, um, I actually then managed to obtain a position with ORCA as the Ocean Watch coordinator. So they have a programme called Ocean Watch, which is involved with the oil and gas industry. So what people would not think conservation, you know, is near. Um, they were trying to get data from oil and gas uh, crew, bridge crews, um, anybody that's at sea all the time, which is such a great, I think it's such a great capture of, of people and areas because you don't get cruise ships and ferry routes that go through oil fields. So you don't know what's happening. Are these animals there? Are they utilising these areas? Are they there just certain, in certain times? What animals are there? Um, and also it's inspiring the people that are there, you know, they're out there 24-7, 365 uh, and they're the ones that are probably seeing these animals more and seeing their distribution and seasonality more than we are. So it's a great programme to get involved with and try and get as many people on board with that. So that's been really interesting. So I've been doing that sort of coinciding with the Hebrides Wildlife Officer job. And then in March, I started the Hebrides Wildlife Officer job on the 23rd of March. I don't know if that date rings a bell to anybody. Yep, <laughs> when lockdown was announced. So, I, so it's been a very different role to what was planned. I was meant to be out um, on a lot of the Calmac ferries, uh, traversing all the routes, uh, collecting data, delivering lectures, inspiring people about these amazing animals. Um, it's been a lot more of a sort of administrative role, um, but I have been able to get, I was able to get out, I think about a few, must have been a few weeks ago now. Um, so I did a little hopscotch tour at the top, but obviously with cases rising again, it's probably a little bit safer to stay inside. Um, all in all though, I've enjoyed the position, even though it has been at, very much focused at home, um, been able to sort of get a bit creative and uh, develop resources for people at home which has been really really fun and this is the uh, trip that I went on so Calmac do sort of an island hopping uh, they do lots of different island hopping trips so I know some of this is cut off here because I because I couldn't get all the pictures on <laughs> um, so this is Malay at the bottom so that's where I started and then I went across to South U Uist to Loch Boisidale and then I drove up to Loch Maddy, which is North Uist, across to Uig, Uig to Tarbert, which is in Harris, and then drove up to Lewis, and you can't see it, I've cut it off, and then Lewis to Ullapool, so right at the top of Scotland. Um, and I was able to see minke whale, uh, common dolphins, some gannets and a skewer there as well. That was just a few of the animals that I, I could see. So. I was when I stepped onto that first ferry of the season, I was holding on like, come on, I've got to see something. And then fortunately on that first trip from Malay to Loch Boisidale, I got these common dolphins and that lovely minky whale there as well. And that was just in the sun as well. It was a really, really nice, memorable sighting. So that's the Hebrides role. So Orca, so they are a marine conservation charity that focuses primarily on cetaceans. So cetaceans are whales, dolphins, and porpoises. It's a bit of a mouthful to say whales, dolphins, and porpoises every time. So cetaceans is a lot easier. So we have three program areas that we focus on. So the first one is inspiring people about the wonders of cetaceans. So this is through our education programs, um, the wildlife officer program, and the cruise conservationist program. And then there's saving cetaceans through citizen science. So this is our marine mammal surveyor program. So this is where we train up dedicated volunteers to become citizen scientists. So our marine mammal surveyors, and they collect this really high impact distance sampling data on board that we can then utilize to then create policy change for cetacean conservation. So it's all very much linked. Um, but we also do research as well. So this image at the bottom is of a whale, unfortunately, being hit by a ship. So Orca are uh, very much involved with vessel strike, which I will explain a little later. So this is our whale education, so inspiring people. So we run Whale Education Month. So this is running now. So in October, we distribute uh, free education packs for teachers um, at the moment it's parents at home um, anybody who wants these school packs 
Uh, this year's theme is ecosystem engineers. So this is a selection of activities, uh, learning, tasks, things like that, that we've put together that coincide with the national curriculum and include aspects of that for, for teachers to deliver in their own classroom. And then we also created all these education resources. So our head of education, Anna, was extremely busy at the start of lockdown, creating these lessons for parents to deliver at home. Um, so these are available completely free. They're on our website and they're also on our YouTube. Uh, people can access these. Some are sort of 10 minutes, some go on, you know, for 30 minutes. Uh, so it's a really good, valuable resource for people at home. And this is regarding the, uh, so the science, the citizen science that we do. So these are our roots. So I know that Graham mentioned UK and Europe at the start, but you can see that we have gone further afield. So we've got our UK and Europe ferry routes on the, it's my right hand side, um, and you've got the west coast of Scotland. And then if you look on the left, it is a very small picture, so I do apologise. Um, we've got sort of Europe, and all the cruise routes that we've done. So we've been able to go up to the Arctic, Svalbard. We've been able to go to Antarctica. So we've gone uh, through Drake Passage to the Antarctic Peninsula. And then we've also been to the Pacific Ocean as well. So we're collecting really, really valuable data in these areas that may not have been surveyed before, or we're, we're, we're uh, making this available for organizations in those areas who have already got collected data with, you know, providing it to them for free as well. So the science and policy. So all that's good. We, you know, we're doing all this good thing, but what, what can you do with it? So I've mentioned that we do distance sampling. So this is used to collect data on uh, butterflies, uh, different types of mammals, um, and it's no different in the marine environment, really. So this is used to establish abundance, Relative abundance, which is relative abundance is sort of the evenness of distribution in a community uh, and the distribution. And the main method that we use this is line transects. So this is if you think about a ferry going forward and you've just got, got a five kilometer grid square and you're just looking like that. And what does that do? So it initially creates a baseline so we've now got a data set that spans over 20 years so we can then see any changes this alerts us to changes so any distribution has there been uh, has an animal not been seen in a certain area in a certain time things like that and then this allows us to contribute to the conservation debate so we've got evidence to support our suggestions and support advice that needs to go forward into government um, so it's always about evidence-based science. And as I say, you know, we've got over a decade of survey data and we also uh, collate this Europe State of European Cetacean Report. So this highlights key threats to cetaceans at that time. We often have a theme as well. So last year we focused on our wildlife officer uh, data. So utilizing that data and what is that showing us about those areas and, and basically just trying to say how valuable that data is as well to our data set. It's not just our marine mammal surveyors, but our wildlife officers that are in this INSPIRE uh, program area, they're also providing us valuable data that can be used for policy. Um, and to inform key, key decision makers and that it helps us to conserve cetaceans and their habitats. So as I mentioned before, we offer our data freely available. It's freely accessible to anybody, students, academia, any governing bodies. Um, you just simply email us saying that you want this data from this time period and we'll just ask you to complete a form. Um, obviously, we will vet who you are. <laughs> We're not going to offer it to sort of a whaling uh, shipping company or anything like that. Um, but yeah, you just have to, you know, vet who you are, what your rationale is. Um, but it's completely freely available. Um, and this is just a list of panels that we currently attend uh, so we're part of ASCABAMS, ACABAMS, we're part of the European Commission um, Lu Lucy who's our head of science and deputy director she's actually um, 
part of the International Whaling Committee, she sits on there. And also we have a part with Wildlife and Countryside Link as well. And as I say, all our data is freely available. And this is just some of the organisations that we've uh, given our data or expertise with, and that could be the actual physical data, um, or that could be um, one of our members of staff going to deliver a lecture at, the, uh, at their establishment, so such as with the universities. Um, and I don't know if any of you have heard of Happy Whale, uh, but it's a great programme. So it's a website which you can upload a picture of a, I think it's humpback whales, sperm whales, uh, blue whales, any, any whale that you can tell uh, individuals by their flute. You can upload a picture and you then sort of wait a day or so and they can come back to you and say, oh, this was this whale and it's been seen on this date and this date and you're helping improve their data set and sort of work out the migrations of whales as well. So if you see it in the Azores and then it's been pictured in the Arctic, um, it's, you know, plugging in gaps of what's happened in, with, with the whale's life history, which is fantastic. Um, and you then also get forward emails. So if anybody uploads it, uploads a picture, they'll then email you to say, this whale has now been seen in da da da. So it's really, really good engaging process and it's a really good way to get people to uh, obviously tell them more about whales, which is great. Um, and then all that data is fantastic. So what policy does it actually help with? So on a local level, our data has been uh, helped with the Scottish MPAs or marine protected areas for Risso's dolphin, minke whale, harbour porpoise in the Hebrides. Um, and on the 25th of September, so this is always an ongoing thing, I don't know if anybody heard, um, but Scottish ministers designated a deep sea marine reserve in the west coast of Scotland. Um, and this is a huge MPA. It's absolutely massive. It was, it, I think it's a combination of lots of different marine protected areas have now become one. Um, so, our, you know, our data goes to include things like, or, you know, change things like that, which is fantastic. Um, and then at the national level, we inform the Harbour Porpoise Special Area of Conservation, which is a type of marine protected area um, in the North Sea. And then at a European level, UK and Europe achieve their reporting obligations under the Habitats Directive because of the data that we have and the data that we produce and our volunteers are the absolute backbone of that. And then the ship strike I mentioned earlier, that awful image. Um, so that's a picture there of a minke whale unfortunately that's been the victim of ship strike so we have uh, James Robbins who used to work for Orca he was the science officer he was successful in um, getting a PhD uh, looking at large vessel chain large vessel ship strike on fin whales in the Bay of Biscay so what his work is to look at the behavior of fin whales when a ship is sort of coming towards them or coming near them because then that will help bridge crews establish what they need to do uh, when they approach this whale do they need to veer to the left do they need to veer to the right do they need to stay the course is the whale going to move so his data his data is going to inform exactly what bridge crews need to do to avoid these whales because I'm sure you know they don't want to hit whales if you think about a blue whale on the on the bow of your vessel that's going to create immense drag and increase your fuel consumption uh, so it's not beneficial for them to do it just just when you look at that alone obviously there's ethical reasons and things like that and um, so yeah so his his work is going towards predicting this animal behavior that he's going to be on the Brittany Ferries vessels and Lucy our head of science is helping uh, supervise his research as well which is fantastic so this is the fun bit for me <laughs> so cetaceans are whales dolphins and porpoises you've all seen one so you probably know a lot of what I'm going to tell you but hopefully I can surprise you with a few different facts so this is the harbour porpoise. This is the only porpoise that we get in Europe and it's our smallest cetacean. So it's about one and a half metres, which I think is still quite big. It's probably just a little bit smaller than me. Um, and they are the most abundant uh, in our coastal waters. They are pretty cool characters. They 
are quite small, but they live in cold waters, so they have such a high metabolic rate. They are constantly foraging, constantly eating, and they eat a wide variety of foods um, just to keep that core temperature as, at what it needs to be. Um, they obviously have a layer of blubber, but they're not a big, a big animal, so they are constantly active. Um, they also echolocate and communicate at a very high frequency and very distinctively. And this is thought to be a avoidance tactic, so to avoid killer whales. Uh, so killer whales can't hear the frequency that harbour porpoise communicate with. Um, and this is what it looks like here. So this is called a spectrogram here on the bottom left. Um, and the sort of pulses are the noise. So this starts at the back of their head with a thing called the phonic lips or monkey lips as some people call it. And this vibrates and then they have this fatty organ in their head. So here that's the melon and it vibrates through the melon and then contacts with a fish or with a piece of in the environment helping them navigate and then it reverberates back to them and it's picked up in their jaw. So echolocation is, is a pretty complicated piece of kit, um, but it's really, really useful underwater. So I'm going to play this. I don't know if you'll all hear it. I hope that you will. Did any, anybody hear that? No. Right. So basically, it sounds like... Like if you were doing a zip up or something like that. Um, it's lots of lots of really quick clicking um, and an interesting fact as well. So why is a porpoise a porpoise? It's to do with their teeth. Uh, so they do up like a zip rather than spade like teeth or conical teeth like a bottlenose dolphin does. So that's how you tell a porpoise and a dolphin. Um, I just thought of that then when I mentioned the zip. Um, so yeah, really, really fascinating creatures and lots of people studying them around the UK, which is great. And then we've got the common dolphin here. So I can assume with 84% of you seeing uh, whales and dolphins in the wild, the majority may have seen common dolphins. Um, these are the whale watcher's best friends. Uh, if you're having a quiet day, you can always guarantee that there'll be a common dolphin either at the start, uh, the middle or the end. They absolutely love coming to vessels, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and they've got this beautiful beige sort of hourglass colour. And yeah, really, really lovely creatures. They, research has found, though, in Scotland, certainly their distribution is moving upwards. So as the temperature is increasing, which is obviously due to climate change, their distribution is moving northward, which is quite, it's changed distributions of other species. So there's possibly, uh, they're utilising the niche of another species and they're out competing other species. So such as the white beaked dolphin. So white beaked dolphins used to be really regular around the west coast of Scotland which now they are not seen as regularly. And they think that the common dolphin is out competing the white beaked dolphin. Um, and that's been seen, I think, since about 2004 or 2006. Um, so really, really recent uh, distribution change there. Um, and this picture here, so I know this isn't too clear, but what I wanted to say here, so there's a, so a solo, or uh, yeah, solo common dolphin living on his own, which is not, common dolphins are really, really social. Um, and that's in the Clyde in Scotland. And he's been called Kylie. Uh, he's been there for about 17 years, I believe. And they've studied his vocalizations and they've noted that he has actually started vocalizing with harbour porpoise and communicating with harbour porpoise only when harbour porpoise are around. So they know this because they can hear the harbour porpoise clicks and then they can hear him clicking, but trying to imitate the harbour porpoise, which is absolutely astounding. He's, he's trying to communicate with another species because he hasn't got any of his own species around, which is 
shows such a great intelligence um, and definitely a self self awareness. And this picture here is of Kylie on the left, and then this harbour porpoise jumping out of the water. So I don't know if the conversation either went too well <laughs> or didn't go well at all. Um, but yeah, it just goes to show the the absolute immense intelligence of these animals. And then, as I say, the common dolphin is out competing this white beak dolphin. So white beak dolphins often quite common around the UK, well common on the west coast of Scotland, they are going a bit further north, um, but they are a really, really lovely animal and um, very chunky, very robust, very, a, a cold water species and you can see it, they're really, really bulky and blubbery. Um, funnily enough, there is an isolated population uh, down in Devon nobody can see rhyme or reason uh, they think that maybe just a few individuals got lost and they decided to set up camp um, but yeah just a really really lovely animal and sometimes they do have a white beak sometimes they don't so don't let that fool you if you are, are out it's mainly this sort of white streak here that you can see and a big chunky animal you know it's going to be a white beak dolphin um, and then we have a bottlenose dolphin. So this is the archetype dolphin. Everybody knows uh, Flipper and this bottlenose dolphin. So we've got this sort of slate metal grey colouring, um, no obvious patterning or anything like that. And these animals are uh, around Scotland and in Wales, certainly. And they are the most northerly bottlenose dolphins that, we, that are, exist in the world. Um, and this is shown in how big they are. Again, I keep coming to this cold water and they need loads of blubber to survive. Um, so compared to the bottlenose dolphins that you see in the David Attenborough um, documentaries, the Floridian bottlenose dolphins, they're nice and slender and sleek and they glide through the water. These animals are not like that. <laughs> Their cousins are definitely a bit chunkier. Um, so they have a lot of blubber on them to cope with the waters around the UK. Um, and this down here, I won't play it again because no, it doesn't work, but just a comparison to the harbour porpoise. So this is a spectrogram here. So this is a recording of the sounds. So these are individual whistles. So you can see how distinctive this is and how similar this is. So this is thought to be an individual bottlenose dolphin sort of saying its name, like, hi, I'm here. Um, so it's sort of self-identifying and making sure that everybody else in the pod knows who it is, which is great. Um, and again, it's just another piece of evidence at how intelligent these animals are. And what Hebrides wildlife officer would I be if I didn't discuss orca? <laughs> um, so orca or killer whales. Um, so they're not actually a whale, they are a dolphin species. Um, and the way to tell a dolphin species is through morphological and genetical uh, aspects. So we've got a dorsal fin in the middle of their body um, and we've got that melon on the top of their head. So they're the morphological uh, features that show that this is a dolphin. But with genetic analysis, it has revealed that it sits in the Delphinidae family, so the dolphin family. Um, and I'm sure everybody agrees these are absolute formidable hunters so intelligent um, I think most people are probably a bit wary of them because you don't know <laughs> what they're thinking what they're going to do next um, pretty amazing characters uh, and in the UK we do have a population of these so the west coast community uh, and they, they sort of go around Scotland and travel to Ireland as well uh, and I do believe that uh, there is a positive, so West Coast community are seen to the day where they, where they have been seen in previous years, which is uh, pretty fantastic. They don't have calendars. They don't, <laughs> they don't know what day is, but they, they know their routes and where to be. Um, and then this picture down here. So this is a very, very special individual. This is John Coe. You may have seen him um, or heard of him. So he's a, uh, a very famous member of the West Coast community. Um, particularly because he's got this notch in his dorsal fin so he's really easy to identify um, and he's often seen with another male um, Aquarius so they're often seen together uh, and yeah if, if you often see certainly in the cetacean forums uh, on Facebook or any other social media uh, 
John Coe was here and a picture or a video and then people trying to follow exactly where he's going. Uh, he's pretty, he's a celebrity up here. Um, but yeah, I have yet to see him. Uh, but there are different pods that come up to the UK. Um, so there are pods that come from Iceland. Uh, there are also pods that come from Norway, certainly up to Shetland. And what's really interesting about the pods that come here is quite a few of them are herring or mackerel feeders. And then they come here and they feed on seals. Um, so they're showing a really diverse sort of just taking advantage of what they can. Um, certainly in the summer they'll come here and then the winter over there, which is, you know, it shows that we've got really, really uh, diverse waters and yeah, we can take on more animals, keep, keep them coming, <laughs> which is great. Um, and then pinnipeds, so that was our cetaceans. You've probably all seen a pinniped around the UK. So these are our seals, um, our earless seals. So we've got a grey seal, which I often think looks like a dog. It's got that Roman nose, mottled colour. Um, and these are the ones that have the white pups um, in November. Um, and then we get the common seals. And these are often the seals that the killer whales feed on is the common seals. Uh, I think they're a little bit smaller than the grey seals. Um, and yeah, the common seals look a bit more cat like cats and they breed over summer. So hence why the killer whales come over summer. Um, but yeah, really, really lovely species. Um, I've been to... I've been to a few common seals uh, and tried to rescue, well, helped a few common seal pups back into the water, which is really cute. And I once came across a uh, black, fully black common seal pup, which is, uh, not, hasn't been, it's been recorded before, but I hadn't seen one before. And it's really, really distinctive and nice to see this different colour morph uh, in the wild, which is great. Uh, so, yeah, that's everything. I hope I covered everything there. Um, does yeah, so anybody have any questions at all or any comments? I'd like to hear if anybody, what, what wildlife people have seen. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Uh, it was very good and thank very you. interesting. And so if you have a question, would you like to... Put your hand up. Leslie. Thank you for a fascinating talk. I wanted to oh, ask a you. bit more about communication. Um, I mean, how much they've found, I mean, for example, when dolphins are hunting, do they think they communicate information, perhaps about prey? Or I mean, I can understand it must be speculative to some degree, but I don't know how sophisticated our analysis is. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously you can echolocation and communication sounds very, very different. So you can tell the difference between echolocation that's very focused and communication often has this, these peaks. Um, so I know certainly with, there's been lots of studies on bottlenose dolphins, certainly social dolphins do communicate where prey is. Um, there's a lot of learning that goes on between a mother and a calf as well. Um, a lot of that learning is visual, but there are they do certain hums, like mm, a really, really quiet hum to communicate to the calf. Uh, sometimes that can be just to let them know that they're there. Um, but, but we don't know. It could be to say, yeah, you're doing the right thing. You need to learn this. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of postulation with this. Um, but there is certainly a lot of evidence with social dolphins. They definitely do communicate the fishes over here. Um, and the, there's also that learning behavior as well that's passed on. Thank you. No problem. Okay, anybody else? Gahan has got his hand raised, Graham. Oh, right. Gahan. Hi, Ashley. Thanks for a great talk. Thank you. You, you mentioned seeing 100 fin whales. Um, was that 100 fin bears on a day? And how many fin bears would you have had at the most in the field of view at the same time? Yeah, so with uh, that was in the Bay of Biscay. So I've seen probably working my way, way up to about 100 fin whales, and that is all in one day. That was all in one crossing. So that's pretty much within the same sort of, could be three hours um fin whales 
but that's also with people helping us. So there could be people on the deck with us. So other passengers and saying, there's one there, there's one there. So that's another set of eyes for us to use. Um, and it's normally, so it depends on the height of your vessel, but you can often see about 20 kilometers and you're always standing on one side. Uh, so yes, yeah, so you can see 20 kilometers in front of you and all the way round. Um, I was reading a report the other day and they saw 302 fin whales on one oh. crossing, on one survey. Oh. Yeah. So my 100 <laughs> isn't, isn't like the record, um, which is fantastic. And that was with, so that's with the surveyors, the marine mammal surveyors. So that's four people on the bridge, undisturbed, and they rotate the survey and they're looking from the front of the vessel. So you've got normally uh, two people, you've got one person looking this way, one person looking that way, and one person looking that way. And they just relay all of that information back to the fourth team member. Uh, so I think that's why they got to get 302 for one survey, which is absolutely astounding. But yeah, that, that, sorry, go on. So at, at any given point, would you have at the most just two or three fin whales in view? Uh, it's, so it depends on your location and it depends on the time of year. So any, if you are going into an area to survey, you always look at sort of what the previous year's reports were um, just to know what to expect. Um, if I was going in the Bay of Biscay for summer, I'd be expecting a hundred fin whales uh, definitely it's a mega feeding area for them but then if I was surveying across the west coast of Scotland uh, during qu in quite shallower areas I probably wouldn't be expecting many fin whales but I think you know at any given one time you, you can see their blows are about eight meters high so if you've got a really clear day you can see about 30 blows at the same time um, in your view from the vessel um, but you've also just you've always got to take into consideration the time of year and the location but yeah I think you could definitely see 30 to 50 at one in one go it's quite it's quite a big when you're that high you can see quite an expanse and they do send, tend to congregate together uh, certainly in the Bay of Biscay to feed um, I know there was a visual from, I think, was it David Attenborough's Blue Planet or one of the David Attenborough's where it was a drone that went up and it was like, this is the biggest congregation of whales that they've ever seen in the Antarctica. And there were fin whales, minke whales, humpback whales, say whales. Um, and obviously the higher you go, the more you can see and there were just absolutely loads. <laughs> so yeah, it's just the higher you go, you see more. But yeah, you can normally see quite a lot with the naked eye. Thank you very much for that. No problem. Okay, any more questions? Uh, Catherine. Hello, um, thank you very much, Ashley. That was great, really interesting. Thank you. Um, my question is, has, uh, do you have um, at Orca any sort of indication of population, um, decline or improvement in the areas that you survey around the UK or in the Bay of Biscay? Yeah, of course. So at the moment, we're building on our data set. So we're trying to identify cetacean hotspots. Um, so at the moment, our data set is for about 10 years. So we're trying to create that. We've only just really created that baseline. So at the moment, we haven't yet identified any declines or different. Uh, certainly, we've noticed there's more common dolphins than there has been in previous years. Um, we're trying to look at different movements as well. So certainly with the common dolphins moving northward. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because you need so much data to ascertain these changes. These animals are quite long lived. They can, you know, they live, in some cases, a bowhead whale can live up to 211 years. Um, with dolphins, you know, it could be up to 60 years. So we're sitting with that, you know, t 10 years is just a snapshot in their life. Uh, so we do need to build on that data. Um, we have recognize that the Hebrides and west coast of Scotland is an absolute hot spot 
Um, for many different species, we've identified the Bay of Biscay as a hotspot, certainly for fin whales and the larger whales, um, and also towards the south of Biscay, so where the southern trenches are, uh, we've actually recognised that this is a hotspot for beaked whales, so these really, really elusive species, and we've now put them on the map for the UK and Spain and said, you know, these areas are really, really important for these animals. Um, so they need protection and conserving because these animals are really, really sensitive to noise. Um, so they, they need to be protected in a, in a very different way to, you know, possibly another species would be protected. So at the moment, it's not, it's not a case of uh, identifying the changes just yet. We're still trying to build up that data and, and use what we've got and identify those hotspots to get that protection now. Um, and then as we go on and further progress this work, we'll be able to look at changes and things like that. Oh, that that's great. So does that mean that there are as yet no marine protected areas um, down the west coast of France and the north coast of Spain as far as um, cetaceans are concerned? Yeah, so I think that they are trying to build a network. Um, so there are protected areas sort of in Gal Gal I can never say it, Galicia, Galicia, because um, there's a lot of work that goes on there. Um, but it's also about making these, are making these uh, protected areas more of a network, because obviously you get dolphins that go from one area to another, what happens to them in between? Um, so no, there, is, there isn't as much protection, certainly across the French coast and the north of Scotland, uh, north of Spain, sorry. Uh, so yeah, we're trying to go for that and make it as evidence-based as we can. And that's what this, all this data supports, uh, that policy into government. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Okay, Robin, what's your question? You, you suggested that the uh, common dolphins were out competing the white beak. Yet the, the white beak is the larger animal. And I wondered what the mechanism was for the competition. Yeah, so it's just about the sort of niche, niche specialisation. So they're obviously utilising the area better than the white beaked dolphin. They're sort of eat, utilize, going through the resources quicker than the white beaked dolphin would. So then the white beaked dolphin's left with very little to nothing. So then they move further north to find the food that they can, the shelter that they can, whatever they need uh, to survive and live comfortably. Uh, the, the common dolphin isn't leaving much left for them. In a sense of food and yeah, things like that. Okay, does that answer your question, Robin? Okay, uh, Pam, I miss. Hello, my question is, um, a couple of years ago, I went to Baja, which is on the Ooh, yeah. west coast of um, Mexico. It's deserted. It's deserted with people, buildings, cruise ships. Um, so it's a great place for bird watching, actually. But what we did go to was a lagoon that was full of grey whales, because that's mm -hmm. where they breed. We took little boats, that board motor, you go into the lagoon and the whales and the calves come up to the boats and stick their heads above the side of the boats and they want you to stroke them. And they clearly enjoy that. One of the crew got a brush and brushed them to get the barnacles off because they're slow <laughs> movers. And I wondered, well, one of our guides said that it's the more astonishing because they seem to have forgiven us because we hunted them almost to extinction. Mm. Um, I wondered if there was any other examples of such a close relationship between man and whale. Yeah, so I've heard this story before, certainly with grey whales. Uh, there was a period where obviously we hunted them um, and they weren't as forthcoming. They didn't come to boats anymore. They had that sort of really wary nature. Um, and then for some reason, a few bold individuals may have bred better or you just don't know. And then that's now perpetuated in their society, which is great for us, um, as long as they don't come into any trouble with that sort of behaviour. 
Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's, a, it's good for tourism and things like that, certainly for inspiring people about these animals. Um, but yeah, it's a really, really good example of how that's mm. turned. Um, I know examples the other way, unfortunately. Um, so I know bowhead whales, they certainly were a lot more forthcoming and they, would, they weren't very shy. Um, and since the whaling era, era these animals are, are the longest lived mammal in, in the world. Um, and they, I think they remember, um, you know, there's individual that was 211 years old, identified by the harpoon marks in its back. Um, so you've got individuals that are around during that time and they don't come anywhere near humans anymore. Mm. Mm. They're really, really wary. Um, and I don't know if anybody has been following uh, sort of cetacean news this summer. There's been uh, a lot of killer whale interactions with humans. So a lot of attacking of boats, um, which uh, some cetacean experts did come together. And they said that although, you know, you, you can't ascertain exactly what this behavior is, um, this is probably a, re a reaction to overuse of their environment they're being forced yeah. to act in this way um so unfortunately no examples of positive interactions not like the gray whale which is fantastic mm. but mm. certainly animals getting wary as well it could be that in order to get to the gray whales i mean I'm doing this from memory you 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 sail for about six days from san diego Mm. And you don't see anything, no signs of man. And so they are isolated and mm. they, they don't see many people. And the ones they see are nice to oh, them. That, yeah. I've actually, I've just thought of an example. So southern right whales, uh -huh. um, they breed uh, in a cove that's in the middle of nowhere. And they've said it's really, so I, I saw a video of it and they said it's so shallow. These are huge animals. So it's really shallow. You could walk up to them in the water and they wouldn't they wouldn't batter an eyelid because they're so used to people not being there and yeah. um, they're so either engrossed in their copulation that they're not looking anywhere else um but yeah that's an example of sort of the interaction being ignored really where's that uh, so that's in south america mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yeah i've nice. seen them um, on there so i've seen videos of them and there's uh -huh. ma male whales upturned with their appendages out and, <laughs> and there's people just next to them taking these pictures and they're completely so, mm. not aware at all mm. Mm. well you must save up and go to baja oh i know it's on my list mm, it. i know <laughs> <laughs> when you said it i was like Ooh. <laughs> it's it's very interesting that i mean there must have been about 10 of us on this little boat and when it happens, when the, the whales come up, nobody says a thing. Everyone's silent think, because yeah. it's just so astonishing. Yeah. They're choosing to interact, aren't they? It's, yeah, it's their choice. It's, they yeah. come up to the boat. Mm. And the calves do exactly the same thing. Yeah, amazing. Mm. Such a different whale as well, grey whales. They're, they're like bottom feeders. Mm -hmm. so they'll lie on their side and feed through the water. Very, very unusual. Mm. Very jealous. Thank you. <laughs> um, I I um, was on a whale watching trip a, a few weeks back uh, out of Tobermory in Mull, and they said on a, a trip a few days before they'd had a minky whale a minky whale come right up to the boat spy hopping, and it seemed to be interested because there was a couple of dogs on the boat. It wow. seemed to be interested in the dogs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But uh, I, I don't know how true that is. But uh, it was it was right by the boat, looking in, you know, as it were. Wow, uh, yeah. minky whales are normally a bit. Ooh. Yeah, so there was some film of this, I think, on Facebook. But uh, I don't know. I mean, we had one come quite close, but it didn't actually do that. Mm. But, uh, I just chip in there because um, I've seen TV footage of this these dolphins um, on the coast of Brazil that cooperate with the fishermen. Ah, uh, yes, of course, yeah. And they yeah. drive the fish towards the fishermen's nets. 
and then the fishermen catch the fish and give the dolphins a share of the catch mm. as the as the reward for for doing so. And it's a long-standing practice. Agreement. <laughs> John, I think you were waving then. Hi, Graham. Yes, thanks. Hi, Ashley. Um, I wanted to know, I used to go to the north coast of Spain quite a lot, um, so around Bilbao and especially San Sebastian. How, how close do they swim to the shore? Would one be able to see them, do you think, from the coast? Uh, if you get to a high point, you'll probably be able to see fin whales. Uh, you'll, you'll most likely see the beaked whales as well rolling in the water. Um, so if you look at a bathymetry map of, of that sort of area, you'll see that there's the deep sea starts really, really close to the shore. So that's why there's this massive array of animals in this area um, is because you've got the continental shelf really, really close to France, opens up a bit, which is where these trenches are, which is where the beaked whales live and then sort of tails down. So you can see lots of things really close to the coast. I'd say just try and get a high vantage point um, and you'll be able to see the larger animals blowing in the distance. Uh, certainly during summer, you'll see beaked whales. Um, I saw on, uh, while I was on my placement, two northern bottlenose whales uh, breach and then land on one another, which is a behavior that the males do. Uh, so this is called jousting. They'll often breach, land on each other and then rake each other with their teeth. Um, it's sort of a, a, a battle um, that they do just to show how big and strong they are. Um, on the way back, I didn't see that. I saw them just rolling through the water, which I can imagine they were having a well-deserved rest. Um, but yeah, certainly just get to a high point and you will, on a summer's day, clear day, you will be able to see things from, from shore. It's actually interesting also to know why, you know, like you're talking about the depths. Yeah, so it's so the continental shelf creates an upwelling. So you've got loads of cold water hitting that continental shelf that's being forced to the surface, which is bringing with it tons of nutrients. And then all the plankton, the phytoplankton are feeding on these nutrients at the surface, which then starts the whole cycle. So then you've got all the crustaceans feeding on them, the zooplankton, uh, then you've got squids. It just starts everything. There's big blooms um, of life there. Thanks. Actually, I've been on an airplane, well, quite a few times, but where I actually got a very good view down for a little bit. I'm pretty close to the coast of France, but I, don't, I didn't see any. <laughs> oh, okay. I always stare out of planes, hoping. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, Diane. Um, sorry. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yes. On a sadder note, Ashley, what about the beached whales? We hear a lot about them mm. coming into um, the coast and the beach. Um, we've had several this year in, in different places, haven't we? I mean, do we know any more about why that happens? Yeah, so it differs between species. So harbour porpoise and smaller dolphin species can often strand because they've been victim of bycatch and thrown overboard they could have a heavy it could be natural and they could have a he heavy parasite load um, or not feeding very well or be injured um, the sort of boom of strandings that we had this summer was with the group that i keep mentioning the beaked whales um, and they came up uh, all across the uk and europe as well um, and these species are often so sensitive to sound um, you know, the QVS beaked whale, which is the deepest dive of marine mammal, which I think it was a month ago, uh, broken its own record at three hours and 45 minutes, um, holding its breath underwater at about 3,000 metres. Um, so any sort of... Ashley's actually on the Isle of Bute at the moment. <laughs> oh, is she? Yeah, maybe it's not too surprising that there's been... Oh, it's been pretty good till now, hasn't it? It has, it has, yeah. Oh, never mind. 
Let's just yeah. wait a minute. It may come back. <laughs> well, while we're waiting, um, I'd just like to chip in with um, going back to the, the, the issue of interaction between cetaceans and, and humans. Um, I think it's quite common for, for some species to come over to, to boats, um, uh, you know, out of curiosity. Graham mentioned the example. Mm. I uh, I did a, a whale or dolphin watching boat trip in the Moray Firth, mm. and um, we spotted a, a small group of bottlenose dolphins, and they were feeding at the time on salmon, and you have to maintain a minimum of 100 meters distance. So we just parked the boat and waited. And uh, when they'd finished feeding, they, they swam over to the boat and they were leaping out of the water around the boat. Um, obviously, you know, enjoying the, 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 the interaction with humans because they could hear us and see us, you know, um, pre appreciating what they're, what they're doing around us. Mm -hmm. So we still no connection with Ashley. Nothing. Vanished for the moment completely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I could add a couple of observations to what Shaq said as well. In, in Sri Lanka, I've done a fair amount of whale watching. Uh, the whales are quite used to the presence of people because there are big fishing fleets out there and, and the whales are left unmolested. I've had on a few occasions sperm whales swimming right up to the boat, so spy hopping. Uh, they're quite curious. And anecdotally, from a very small sample size of two occasions, I have noticed when there are children on the boat, the sperm whales seem particularly curious and come right up and they almost touch the boat. And the other interaction you see often now, the spinner dolphins and other dolphins that come and bow ride. And I've seen at least two different species doing that. Yeah, I've seen dolphins bow riding off the coast mm -hmm. of Chile. Um, as well. Yes, we, we had those on mulls, but they were kind of more chasing the boat than bow riding. They were kind of surfing the, the wake. Um, mm. you know, so the, the, the boat would stop and the dolphins would sort of come swim around the boat. And I think they were actually, they were fishing at the time. And they said that the fish would come and hide under the boat. So the, the dolphins would come up to the boat because there'd be fish underneath it. And then when we'd been watching them for a while, the, the captain just roared off full speed and the dolphins all just came hurtling after in the wake, you know, obviously just loving it, you know, just for the sheer hell of it. And that's what they look like, they're just playing. Um, so it's got really brilliant fun, but I'd love to be a dolphin. <laughs> um, but uh, in the next life, maybe. But, uh, yeah. Thank you, I must go, thank so, you. I was just, I was, oh, yeah, I, I was just going to say I was lucky enough to be on a boat in the Sea of Cortez, so close to where the other lady, where Pam, Pam was, and uh, we just saw a whole school of dolphins just leaping um, across about 30 dolphins after a shoulder fish. It was just amazing. That's the most amazing piece of wildlife I've ever seen mm. in my life. Mm. And then, um, you know, the only thing that was missing was uh, there wasn't a David Attenborough commentary. It was just, <laughs> really, really was. No, I mean, it uh, is. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, no, it's something really special. I mean, it's, yeah. it's mm. the first time I've seen that many, really got that close to dolphins. I don't, yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing, really wonderful. Yeah. The, the only other thing I wanted to say was whilst we were in the Sea of Cortez was, um, I can't remember which species of whale it was, but I was very aware that there were sort of boats full of sightseers all thrashing across, racing after this whale. And I, won I was wondering, you know, if the whale was really enjoying it, because it almost looked like there were three or four boats full of tourists in pursuit, in hot pursuit of this whale that was, looked like it was thrashing to get, well, it looked like it was swimming very fast to get away. And I just wondered, you know, because um, because I've actually just been to the Wildlife Photographer of the Year exhibition, and there's a, a very um, 
harrowing f photo from Mexico um, showing showing a, a, a whale with its young, with a young calf, and the whale, um, the tail is sort of, it's severed, or has been severed by a propeller. And I just wondered, you know, in Mexico, if um, they're getting a little bit over enthusiastic with the with their um, tourism, their wildlife tourism. But it's just, a, a, just I wondered if there was any. Sort of well, there are there are protocols for for whale watching mm. organisations to follow, and the, the primary one is you don't you don't chase the whales. You mm. you wait for them to come to you. Or you know you, you get closer to them, but you you, you keep a you know I think a hundred meters distance, something like that. And if mm. they want to come any closer, then that's fine. But you don't you don't chase them because that's mm. almost bound to uh, to just destroy your own business in the end. You know because you'll mm. just frighten all the whales away. Mm. But uh, so all the the one I've been on been on on in Tobermory, they're they're very strict about not not pursuing anything you know they'll, they'll sort of go towards it but they won't uh, Ashley's coming back really good <laughs> hello welcome back <laughs> <laughs> so sorry about that my internet just dropped I do apologize thank you for bearing with <laughs> we've been sharing our anecdotal uh information with each other whilst yeah and someone was just asking about um stating a, an experience of seeing whale watching boats sort of actively pursuing a whale in a way that it seemed like it wasn't enjoying and if we could say a bit about how how whale watching should be carried out ideally yeah of course um and i i don't know if diane's still here i was just addressing her question wasn't i when it when doesn't look like she's still here does she it may have just left actually okay um yeah so in regards to sort of whale watching there are there is a code of conduct um certainly with whale tourism becoming more and more popular um these things do have to be regulated because you can get the sort of foolhardy people that you know do chase whales down um do stress these animals out um, and I know a study in Australia did reveal that there were uh, behavioural changes in the humpback whales and the calves there. Um, so they noticed very distinctive uh, jerking away from the mothers um, and their calves. Um, there, were, there was, you know, this is a big calving area uh, for these animals. And it's a great tourist attraction, you know, it's great to see these animals in the wild. But there were so many boats uh, go into these areas with so many people and the boats were going quite fast um, and there were lots of different sort of behavioural changes, sounds produced by these animals that clearly weren't comfortable. Um, and this has gone to help sort of this, you know, write this code of conduct. Um, you, you don't have to abide by it. There's no set regulations, but if you do abide by it, it's called WISE. Uh, so this WISE whale watching scheme, um, you can then say that you're an, a, a WISE accredited tour operator. So this really helps people choose the correct tour operators so that you know that they're operating to this sort of code of conduct and you know that they've got the animal's welfare at their best interest as well as you know, make, helping you see them and creating a revenue for themselves. They're also thinking about the well-being of these animals. So, yes, yeah, certainly there are, there is evidence of people disturbing these animals. Um, but you know, there is also evidence of operators trying to oblige by these these rules. And and they you know they help researchers on the boat. That you know the researchers on these boats are conducting this research that then goes to help this code of conduct. So there are good ones out there, and they're often with this wise. They've often got the wise accredited accreditation attached to them as well so that's always good to look for if you are looking for a whale a whale watching trip um in anywhere across the world uh, always look for that accreditation i'd say can you say what that was again wise. Uh, so it's wise yeah w-i-s-e okay thank you check <laughs> um 
I wonder if you could say anything about pollution and cetaceans. Um, I'm, I'm thinking in particular what, what I've heard of is the um, uh, well PCBs in, in the mm. North Sea and their impact on orcas and also PCBs in New Zealand and their impact on orcas. And I believe the, the resident orca pod uh, in Britain is, uh, hasn't produced any young for several years. Yeah, of course. Uh, so the West Coast community that I mentioned before, Jonco and Aquarius, these huge balls, these famous balls from this community. Um, there is thought to only be eight individuals left in this one single pod. Um, and certainly you are right, Czech. They, uh, they haven't produced an offspring in about 20 years. Um, and it's probably not looking like they will, which means that this population is biologically extinct. Um, they are heavily polluted with PCBs. Um, this was found when an individual called Lulu stranded in Scotland um, and she was found to have 25 times the, the recommended sort of minimum limit of PCBs pollution in your body. Um, and what they do, polychlorinated biphenols, they sort of disturb the endocrine system so your hormones and um, so these animals may not come into estrus they may not get this hormone sort of change that makes them think right now i need to sort of reproduce or they may be reproducing but these offspring aren't surviving um, so there's loads of different sort of aspects that these pcbs can be affecting them um, but yeah, this is happening uh, in orcas worldwide, mainly because PCBs uh, have a high affinity for fat and lipids. So all this blubber means you've got something to stick to and they bioaccumulate. So if a smaller, if it's in zooplankton, phytoplankton, then it's in a little fish. Then it magnifies because this fish is eating all of this food and then a larger fish eats that and then a killer whale eats that larger fish. That larger fish is absolutely full to the brim of PCBs and a killer whale might need, you know, 20, 30 fish a day. Uh, so then it's just getting more and more polluted, you know, throughout its lifetime, which unfortunately isn't great for the survival of the species. Um, and that was reported as well in the in Blue Planet 2 with the pilot whales. Um, I don't know if you remember sort of the heartbreaking scene of the mother trying to feed, feed its calf and carrying its calf around with them. But she had actually indirectly killed her calf because the milk that she was feeding to her calf was so polluted that the calf could not deal with that pollution load. And they do have these, certainly pilot whales, have these big social bonds. They're the ones that strand often uh, in groups. Uh, so you'll often, you may have seen them in New Zealand where 400 or so strand. These are often because one individual or a few individuals are sick and um, they can make a wrong turn sort of within sandbanks. But pilot whales have this really strong social network so they all tend to follow one another. And um, so hence why this individual was carrying its calf around with them. It's also been seen in killer whales uh, last year in North America. Um, a killer whale was carrying her calf whip round with her. Fortunately, that killer whale has been successful this year um, and produced a fertile offspring. So it's good news for her this year. Hopefully uh, she can raise that offspring to be nice and chunky, ready for the winter. Um, but yeah, it is a big problem in these big predators. Certainly all that blubber and all that food that they need just really creates a problem with these, uh, these chemicals. Thanks. Mm. Leslie's got a question. Yes. Yes, um, I had a follow-up question to that. I saw a beach dead whale in North Norfolk a few years ago. Mm. I mean, it was a very, very sad, but quite an awe-inspiring sight. Um, it also hissed, which I take it was processes of dissolution. But is there some kind of procedure that has to be gone through when a whale stray? You know, do, do people come along and try to establish what was the cause of the um, death or the stranding? Or is it just, um, you know, opportunistic where the resources are? Mm. 
I'm glad you asked that because I did want to kind of come back to Diane's question if she does watch this back. Um, so yeah, so strandings do happen, unfortunately, in the smaller species, as I said, this could be bycatch, um, it could be disease. In the beaked whales, the boom of beaked whale strandings that we've seen this summer, it could be linked to naval exercises or any sort of sound exercises that have been happening. Um, these animals are really deep diving, any sounds, could alert them they come up to the surface and they get the bends and um, then there's also larger animals so the larger whales and um, I actually attended the fin whale stranding that was in North Wales this year um, and we called him Henry the fin whale he was a juvenile fin whale and um, he was about 13 meters um, and all of these animals they are not left um, there are organisations across the UK that try to ascertain exactly what the cause of death is and certainly look at trends in certain species as well. Um, so in Scotland, there is the Scottish Marine Animal Stranding Scheme. So that's called SMAS um, and that's run by Andrew Brownlow. So him and his team will go and take biopsies of certain animals where they can um, or volunteers will collect these biopsies. Sometimes they take the whole individual, so there's freezers full of porpoises, um, and then they'll do a, a full autopsy or necropsy on the individual to see what the cause of death is. This is then available publicly, you know, they often sort of say on their social media exactly what happened and that they include it in their yearly reports. Um, in England, and I think they cover pretty much most of Wales now, um, it's called CSIP. So the Cetacean Strandings Investigation Programme, this is part of the Zoological Society of London. Um, and this is mainly head by Rob Deville um, and Matt Perkins, I think helps him out as well. Um, so they are, they're pretty mad. They're all over the UK all the time. You follow them on the social media. It's like, right, I'm in Wales collecting this poor poison. And then the next day they're like, right, I'm in Sussex. It's like, how did you even get that far? <laughs> um, he goes and, collects as many as he can um, and he does a bit of a necropsy while he's there uh, just to ascertain if there's any uh, physical injuries or anything he can tell from the animal on the outside of what you think it might be the cause of death and then they take a lot of the samples back to the lab um, and try and work out the cause of death there and again it's all made publicly available um, and they write this all up in yearly reports as well and do look for any differences in you know causes of death is is there more are there more porpoises dying of bycatch if there is what's going on you know you need a bit more legislation maybe in fisheries or change uh, sort of equipment um certainly with the fin whale that i attended so they did come on i think it was so it's like a sort of three day uh very bittersweet experience uh the first day we tried to get him out managed to get them out second day we kind of were just trying to care for him we kind of knew if he's here for a second day it's probably not looking good so let's just make him as comfortable as possible um and then third day yeah we unfortunately I couldn't sleep so I had to go in the morning <laughs> and just patrol and see if I could find him and unfortunately he had passed away in the night um but an investigation was on him and my initial findings when I saw him there was no sign of infection no sign of there's no obvious injuries and um, he wasn't malnourished uh, he did look a little bit thin but that might be just because it was only sort of a one day without food or he wasn't very he wasn't skeletal or anything um, so for, on the outside I my thought was it's just a juvenile that's just been weaned which he was the size to have just been weaned um, and he's sort of gone to live independently and unfortunately it's probably got caught by a bad tide or been in the wrong area um, and that was consistent with Rob Deville's findings he didn't find any sort of parasites or much pollution no plastics uh, which was a good thing uh, so yeah so there are people all over the UK certainly trying to help uh, cetaceans especially with strandings um, and ascertain exactly what the cause of death is because uh, then we can know what not to do which uh, can be quite instantaneous 
uh, that sort of research I find. But yeah. Thank you. That's very helpful. <laughs> uh, John? You mentioned um, the bends, and I never thought of that, about how do cetaceans deal with the depth change? Yeah, so with uh, the Cuvier's beaked whale, obviously it's absolute extremes, 3,000 metres, three hours and 45 minutes, They're, they have to have adaptations for that, those limits. Uh, so with Cuvier's beaked whale, they have collapsible lungs, so it makes them negatively buoyant. So they don't swim to the bottom. They sort of just sink to the bottom. So there's no exertion in that respect. Um, they also have a lot more myoglobin than we do. And myoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen. So it will hold on to the oxygen a lot more than our hemoglobin does. Um, so yeah, so they've got... And their muscles are just... If you look at... Um, so a cuvier beaked whale sort of tail, which is all muscle, it is, it's, it's difficult to describe. It's like really dark red. It's absolutely full packed of myoglobin. Um, so it's got all this oxygen that they don't readily release. Uh, there are lots of other adaptations, but for the life of me, they have left me right now. <laughs> um, but the collapsible lungs and the myoglobin, I do remember them. Um, but yeah, just absolutely fascinating creatures. Does that mean, in other words, that gives them more time to come up slowly and that's how they deal with the bends, basically? So they only get the bends normally when they come up too quick. So they'll sink down to the surface. They'll spend, it's often about 45 minutes to an hour. Three hours and 45 minutes is sort of to the limit. It's not, that's not a regular foraging behaviour. So they'll often be down there for 45 minutes. They'll probably pretty comfortable in that time and then they'll come up really really slowly at a diagonal like that so they're not um they're not exerting too much energy uh they can slowly pump up their lungs so yeah just uh, yeah they just come up diagonally and then get to the surface and they take one big breath and they'll stay at the surface normally for about a few few minutes it's not even like they have to rest for that long and then they'll go back down. So this is why not much is known about these species because they are so well adapted to being down there. We really, really irregularly get to see them. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And just to add as well, I know Leslie and Diane both asked about strandings. Um, if anybody, I'm sure most of you have heard, um, but there is a, a sort of medic, a volunteer medic organisation called BDMLR. So this is British Divers Marine Life Rescue and they are involved in any sort of marine mammal, uh, ocean marine mammals, so seals and whales, dolphins and porpoises. If you ever do come across an animal that you think is possibly stranded or injured, uh, do call BDMLR and they've often got lots of uh, volunteers on call to go out and help at these events. Graham Gehan's got a hand raised. I don't know whether he still wants to ask the question. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, just going back to whale watching in the Bay of Biscay. Um, can you give an idea whether you get close enough to the whales to photograph them with the telephoto lens? And also what sort of whales would you see on a typical crossing? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so the Bay of Biscay is a fantastic route to see a diverse array of animals. Um, you can see harbour porpoise, common dolphin, bottlenose dolphin, striped dolphin, uh, minke whales. You can see orca. Orca normally are around the start of the season, so sort of April, May time. Um, you can see uh, Risso's dolphins. Uh, you get say whales, minke whales, fin whales. I've seen a blue whale there before, sperm whales. Um, you should have asked what you can't see there, really. Okay. <laughs> um, it's such a good area to see whales and dolphins. And they do, you can get some great photos of them. Most of the best photos that I've got of uh, cetaceans are from the Bay of Biscay. Um, certainly species like common dolphins and striped dolphin, they're really, really active. They'll come towards the vessel. So they're pretty much begging to be photographed. 
Um, and there are some encounters which can be really, really close. So you can often see uh, fin whales can be really, really close to the vessel. Um, I certainly was on, when I was on my internship, that we were sailing and there was a say whale that was sort of, so the boat's here, the say whale was here. And it was a bit too close for comfort. I personally think the sail, sail whale was asleep um, and the boat disturbed him. I don't think he heard the, way, uh, the boat. But fortunately, it, was, it wasn't close enough to hit the whale. Um, I don't know what I would have done <laughs> if that did happen. Um, but, you know, we just saw this say whale sort of turn round, look directly at us at the top and was just like, oh! Um, so you can get some really, really close encounters. For me, if you're going to go anywhere whale watching, uh, for, you know, and get some good photos, Bay of Bis and you don't want to be cold, Bay of Biscay is the one. <laughs> but on a, on a typical trip, would you just see two or three species? Although, you know, over 10, mm. 20 trips, you may see a lot of species. No, in the, so in the summer, we orca host what are called sea safaris. Um, so that's uh, normally sort of a three or four day trip. So that's basically just sailing there and back. And you're on board with loads of orca uh, surveyors. So you're on the top. And you've got eyes everywhere. And they can sometimes see up to a thousand animals on days like that, 2,000 animals uh, of a variety of different species. Uh, and that's just in a couple of days. So it really does, you just need the more eyes, the better. And you've got to put the time in as well. That's, that's my advice with whale watching. Thank you. That's very encouraging. Post COVID, <laughs> I must do one of those trips. Have a look at the Sea Safaris page on Orca, okay, you'll I'll be able Google to see them. there. Yeah. Thank you. Mm, right, I can't see any more hands up. Have we got any more questions? I don't think, don't think we do. We all done? Everyone inspired about whales and dolphins now? <laughs> well, <laughs> Yep. Job done. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so thank, thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Well, thank, thank you. you. Uh, that was very good. Um, very nice. So I, yeah, got a good set of questions there. It does. <laughs> okay. So thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you for Ashley for an excellent talk. Oh, thank uh, you. Thank you. Organizing. Everyone, thank everyone you. look after yourselves. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yes.